This is the explosion of the first atomic bomb. How does it differ from other explosives? It destroys by blast as effectively as 20,000 tons of TNT. But other explosives destroy by blast. It destroys by heat and fire, but so do other explosives. What makes it different is its deadly radioactivity. The invisible particles and rays, which include neutrons, alpha and beta particles, and gamma rays, are the greatest menace of all. The terrible effects of this radiation on mankind were graphically demonstrated by casualties such as these at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Skin lesions, loss of hair, and sterility were observed. Death was the most frequent result of exposure to nuclear radiation. This radiation menace was recognized in the plan for Operation Crossroads. A section was organized to protect the personnel of Joint Task Force One from these hazards. This section was known as the Radiological Safety Section. The first task of the radiological safety section was to aid in planning. Even the determination of the schedule for Able Day itself involved radiological safety. Weather conditions were of prime importance. Admiral Blandy, with his safety advisor, Captain Lyon, and other members of his staff, discussed the anticipated movement of the atomic cloud. Carefully plotted in the consultations with meteorologists was the probable track of the cloud. Danger areas were outlined and described. Weather conditions appeared favorable. Admiral Blandy made his decision. July 1st, 1946 was the day for test ABLE. All operations groups were alerted. Technicians of the radiological safety section were the monitors who were to detect and measure the radioactivity resulting from the bomb explosions wherever it occurred. These monitors were the working arm of the section charged with the protection of every member of the task force from radiological dangers. They had to understand the complex nature of the hazards which they were to measure and report. In addition to instrument operation, they were assigned many specific tasks. Monitors had to accompany all aircraft, lagoon patrols, boarding teams, salvage groups, and all downwind reconnaissance missions. Procedures varied but the fundamental principles of radiological monitoring were applied to all assignments. These monitors are checking their X263 Geiger counters over a radioactive source. After the atomic explosions, the information they collect will guide all operational units. A group entirely new to military organization will be tested for the first time under actual operating conditions. Here, pilots are being briefed for tracking airborne fission products of the bomb. Pilotless aircraft had to be guided on a planned course which would take them through the radioactive cloud column. All other aircraft were to avoid the radioactive cloud. Other aircraft take off prepared to guide their drones remotely by radio through the atomic cloud. Drones are launched and quickly guided to their assigned positions aloft. Additional planes were on station to direct radio-controlled boats in the target area. Army Air Force B-17 drones take off from Enoetok to fly 180 miles to Bikini in time for the burst. Test able. The bomb detonates several hundred feet above the surface of the lagoon. In this ascending cloud are fission products which release deadly gamma and beta radiation. Against this menace, the radiological safety section had to protect personnel of the task force. Through the nose of an Army Air Force B-17 drone about to enter the radioactive cloud, an automatic camera records the seething poisonous fog. Drone boats were guided through the target fleet by radio signals from the control ship at sea and by low-flying aircraft. These drones collected samples of the radioactive water for laboratory analysis. From the drone boats, the telemetering Geiger counters relayed radiation intensities being encountered on the surface and thus acted as scouts for later patrols. This information and similar data from the telemeters on target ships 
was received and transcribed aboard support ships by Esterlin Angus recorders. These instruments correlated radiation intensities with elapsed time on a moving paper scroll. Instrument readings were then sent to the radiological plotting unit aboard the flagship Mount McKinley. Here they were recorded on charts of the lagoon. Additional measurements were obtained from monitors in the field. Preliminary information had come from radio contacts with airborne monitors. Contours of radiation intensity were drawn from this data. These contours were used in deciding when radiological patrols on the surface might safely advance into the lagoon. As soon as clearance was received, support ships prepared to dispatch radiological patrols to survey the lagoon. The patrols carried radiological teams to measure the radiation. Facing special operational problems for the first time, these teams demonstrated the value of previous training. Each patrol consisted of one gunboat flanked by three or four landing craft. Six of these patrols scouted for the entire task force. Each patrol had an assigned survey sector to scout. Activities were directed from the gunboat of each unit. As the patrols cautiously advanced, radio contact was maintained with the plotting unit aboard the Mount McKinley. These patrols furnished information which was used in advising the task force commander when re-entry could safely be made to the target area and to the adjacent islands. The Geiger counter model X263 was one of the monitor's most useful instruments. It was essential for the continuous measurement of radiation from the lagoon. While the patrols proceeded with this survey, the plotting unit aboard the Mount McKinley transferred this information to its charts. In some instances, special clearances for limited times within the lagoon were given. These were carefully calculated so that no individual could be exposed to more than one-tenth Rentgen per working day. This is the maximum dosage completely safe. Each member of the section performed a specific task in the radiological situation. A glance at the charts permitted rapid situation summaries which could then be sent to Admiral Blandy. This information was essential to the task force commander in making his decisions. As areas were reported clear, preparations were made to get the initial boarding teams underway. These groups included specialists of various technical units who were assigned the task of determining the damage. A monitor accompanied each inspection team. This involved the next project for radiological safety. With each team went a monitor to check all areas immediately before inspection teams boarded target ships. The group in each boat was equipped to function as an independent unit. As they moved into the target area, the monitors read their meters constantly. Here the type 247 ion chamber is being used. Before anyone could remain aboard a target ship, it was necessary to determine that the ship was completely free from harmful nuclear radiation. A permanent record of conditions encountered was maintained for detailed analysis. Air-conditioned stowage of radiological instruments was highly important. The monitors returned their instruments to the stockroom for calibration and maintenance following completion of an assignment. This monitor is turning in a Geiger counter the pencil-like instrument is a dosimeter. It measures accumulated exposure in a given period. The box-like instrument is an ionization chamber used to measure high-intensity gamma radiation. All of these instruments were frequently checked to ensure reliability. The monitor's work was no better than his instruments. Air-conditioned storage is required in tropical climates where high relative humidity is encountered. Instruments most used at Bikini were Geiger counters and ionization chambers. Dosimeters measured total exposure to gamma radiation. When exposure of any individual in one working day exceeded one-tenth Rentgen, that person was temporarily withdrawn from active participation. These instruments provided a continuous indication of the accumulated dose quickly, accurately, and on the spot. After the completion of each mission, these dosimeters were recharged before their next use. The instrument group, one of the technical units of the radiological safety section, worked long hours.
to maintain the limited number of instruments in efficient operating condition. This highly technical work could be carried out only by experienced personnel. Portable Geiger counters required constant maintenance and frequent replacement of parts. Another measure of accumulated external radiation dosage was obtained from film badges. These badges were issued by the photographic dosimetry unit to all monitors and personnel working in areas which might be radioactive. This badge is essentially a strip of gamma sensitive film which measures accumulated dose. When turned in after completion of a mission, the film was stripped from the badge and developed like any photographic film. Carefully controlled conditions were necessary in order to obtain reproducible quantitative results. With proper care, photographic dosimetry will yield precise information. Film was first attached to clips and then processed in various solutions required in development and fixation. The resulting negatives were then checked visually. Next, a densitometer was used to measure relative film densities. In this manner, external radiation exposures were determined. Comparison with calibrated standards gave precise information. Each film was read four times to avoid errors. Any exposure above tolerance was noted and reported to the radiological safety advisor who cautioned the wearer against further contact with radiation. Complete records were kept of all exposed personnel and the dosage each received. This protected all persons of the task force from receiving harmful amounts of external nuclear radiation. Before each detonation, the photometry group placed aboard target vessels film devices designed to measure the gamma radiation. Cylinders containing the film were enclosed in iron castings of graduated thicknesses. These provided graduations of shielding. Measurement of the recovered film determined the strength and the energy of gamma radiation and the effectiveness of the shielding. Film badges were also placed throughout target vessels to measure total dosage. In certain instances, these were encased in wooden blocks so that if a ship were sunk, the blocks could still be recovered and the record examined. Planning for test Baker, scheduled for July 25th, went on concurrently with post-ABLE operations. Colonel Stafford L. Warren, chief of the radiological safety section, held frequent conferences with members of his technical staff on radiological problems of the underwater detonation. Test Baker. This detonation occurred below the lagoon surface. Residual radioactivity was more of a problem after test Baker than after test Abel. Radioactive fission products were widely spread over the target array and over large areas downwind by the mist of this base surge. Baker Day operations were much like those of Abel Day, but approach to the ships was greatly delayed. First reports of radiological conditions came from telemeters on drone boats and aboard target ships. This information was relayed to the plotting room aboard the Mount McKinley. Such high readings were reported that radiological patrols were warned to proceed very cautiously. Ships which operated in the radioactive waters soon became contaminated and the crews of some of the smaller vessels had to be temporarily evacuated. Measurements of the water and of the currents below the surface were made in the fear that material at lower depths might have been carried in different directions from that observed at the surface and would thereby trap patrol craft. Once the radioactivity below the surface had been determined, it was possible by oceanographic methods to predict whether cleared areas could again become dangerously radioactive. Samples from different areas and depths were collected, put in numbered bottles, and turned in for analysis. This was done with a laboratory model Geiger, Mueller counter and scaler. This same method was used to determine the radioactivity of water for washing and drinking. If appreciable radioactivity had been detected, 
a ship would have been ordered out into the open ocean for replenishment of its water supply. When salvage ships were finally allowed to enter the lagoon, they hosed down target vessels, not to put out fires, but to remove radioactive materials. Active fission products were strongly absorbed by the target surfaces. Time proved to be the most effective factor in decreasing the activity over such large and varied surfaces. Natural radioactive decay reduced fission product activity almost inversely with time after detonation. Long-lived fission products and unfissioned material introduced internal radiation hazards which may persist for an extremely long time. After the washing down, radioactivity was again checked to determine whether appreciable reduction of intensity had resulted. Frequently, the radioactivity was so great that it could be measured several hundred yards from the ships. Extreme care was therefore necessary in approaching target vessels. Monitors exercised the greatest vigilance. So widespread was the radioactive contamination that the most comprehensive monitoring aboard the target vessels was required. Particularly hot areas found were coils of line, rope-plated fenders, and canvas. These were marked with warning signs and declared out of bounds for personnel engaged in removing test equipment. Before restarting air conditioning and ventilation systems, the surrounding air was checked by means of a filter queen, a device which collected the contaminated particles on a blotter-type filter for later measurement with a counter. Results of later measurements were used in evaluating potential hazards of internal radioactive poisoning. Workers' clothing contaminated during removal of equipment from target ships frequently had to be discarded. All contaminated gear transferred to technical ships was subject to a minimum of handling. Once aboard the technical ships, this equipment was monitored again. If too highly contaminated to be examined carefully, it was quarantined until radioactive decay was sufficient to permit handling. Separate storage spaces were provided for this purpose. Precautions were constantly taken to protect all personnel involved in such occupations. Contaminated clothing was set aside where it was later examined by a monitor charged with safeguarding his assigned group. His decision was final in all safety matters pertaining to radioactivity. Working time of men exposed to high intensities of external nuclear radiation was limited. Strictly observed was the basic doctrine that total dosage per man could be no more than one-tenth Rentgen per working day. Monitors were always available to advise workers concerning necessary precautions on certain jobs. A special laundry service was set up to handle contaminated clothing. Monitors would also ascertain that personnel involved were still further protected by a series of soap and water showers. Many scrubbings were often necessary. After each shower, the worker was re-monitored, and if still contaminated, he was directed to scrub down again. All working spaces and equipment used by other technical groups were surveyed for harmful contamination. By means of earphones with a Geiger counter, it was possible to make more precise measurements. Evaporators and salt water systems were found to concentrate radioactive materials and therefore required special examination. Internal radiation poisoning was a danger existing wherever long-lived fission products and unfissioned material were present. Equipment which was known to be contaminated was brought in for scrutiny. Many times such examination revealed that the gear could be handled and even disassembled within certain limitations. In such instances, the monitor would specify the precautions to be observed. An instrument known as a proteximeter was employed in the laboratories in much the same manner as the dosimeter was used in the field. 
in the vicinity of contaminated material, these proteximeters permitted frequent checks on accumulated radiation exposure. Working time limits were established to prevent excessive dosage. Film badges and dosimeters were used in the protection of divers operating in the target area. In addition to these, a watertight cylinder containing a gamma-sensitive ionization chamber was employed in diving operations. This was known as a deep water probe. By connecting this probe to an Esterlin Angus recorder, the monitor could observe the underwater intensities being encountered by the diver. Because sunken ships and the lagoon bottom were both highly contaminated, the diver was briefed on special precautions. The deep water probe was attached and its lines ran alongside his airline up to the surface ship. Above on the diving ship, the Esterlin Angus recorder responded to any radiation to which the probe was exposed. Thus, the diver was protected closely at all times. Divers returning to the surface were met by monitors who collected their dosimeters and film badges for analysis. Since the radiation from the lagoon bottom was absorbed by the water, the intensity near the diver's feet was often much greater than near his head. Badges were placed, therefore, on different parts of his body. The marine biology group employed small life rafts in many surveys. These marine biologists were among the several scientific groups also at work. Numerous specimens of marine life were collected. Poisoning was one effective method of obtaining specimens. Collections of all types of fish and marine life were made both before and after Abel and Baker days in order to investigate more fully the effects of radioactive contamination upon marine life. Spearing was employed to obtain other specimens. Fish were obtained both within the lagoon and outside on the reef of Bikini Atoll. Samples of algae and plankton in addition were collected. These organisms were known selectively to absorb some of the radioactive fission products. This explained the dangerous accumulation of radioactivity on hulls at Bikini, even on ships not exposed as targets. Specimens were then brought to the laboratory ship for further study. No radioactivity was detected in fish collected after test able, but following the underwater detonation, radioactive material was found concentrated in the gills, digestive tract, liver, and bones of many a specimen. Some of these fish were so radioactive that they could take their own photographs when placed in contact with gamma-sensitive film. With such specimens available, evaluation of the effects of nuclear radiation will go on for years. Studies were also conducted with other types of living organisms by the Naval Medical Research Group aboard the Burleson. The Marine Biology Group and other technical units have enough data in their possession to assess the insidious possibilities of this new weapon. Departure of the operational fleet from Bikini in no sense marked the end of the operation. Rather, it was the beginning of an important phase. Even non-target ships required extensive checking and frequently decontamination to prevent the spread of the radioactivity throughout the harbors and ports of the United States. The underwater test at Bikini gave compelling proof of what radioactivity can do. Both tests provided the armed services practical experience in coping with some of the problems which must be faced in the event of atomic war. This lethal mist containing the activity equivalent to hundreds of tons of radium might be moving through a populated community, leaving death and panic in its wake and the area uninhabitable. At Bikini, the radiation was lethal over an area greater than five square miles. In a harbor, this area might be several times as large. Moreover, a very serious contamination problem would have been created for miles downwind of this area. 
Until world controls are developed to prevent the use of the atomic bomb, radiological safety is a practical problem for everyone. One of the outstanding benefits of Operation Crossroads was realization of the seriousness of the radioactive hazards. The knowledge and experience gained in combating these deadly effects must now be used in planning for the future.